Greetings, everybody. Get your King James Bible. Turn to Ezekiel 26. We are going to take a look at uh, the whole chapter. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Ezekiel 26, this has a very, very interesting backstory, and I'll try to do it justice. Sometimes you got to realize that the Lord speaks of such things in the future as though they're the, the past. So... Keep that in mind. Now, Tyrus and Tyre, T-Y-R-E, well, is in Lebanon, which is north of the currently occupied Israeli state. And uh, they were on the coast. They were an ocean-going people. Probably, well, they were tied in with the Phoenicians and probably Carthage, and probably Dan. Uh, I don't know exactly because you're going back that far. And maybe 100, 200 years ago, you could have had some decent history books. But today, all the history books have been rewritten. And our history is being erased as I speak. And virtually has been erased. We haven't had decent history books probably at least, at least 100 to 150 years, probably 200 years. My college, Palm Beach State College, as it's called now, had some books from the 19 teens and 1920s. And they were getting rid of the old books. So they just had a pile there. It says, take whatever you want. So I went and grabbed a couple of history books and uh, went through them, read them. And what they taught in history basically 100 years ago and what they teach today is totally different. I wish I still had those books, but they were stolen from me by one of God's chosen people, if you catch my drift. So... All right, Ezekiel 26 and verse 1. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, because that Tyrus hath said against Jerusalem, Aha! She is broken. That was the gates of the people. She is turned unto me, I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. Verse 3. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations, and I will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. Listen to this carefully. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. Now we're going to read this again when I get done. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil to the nations. And her daughters, which are in the field, shall be slain by the sword. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, before... Well, let's, I think I'm going to keep reading and then we'll go back. Verse 7. 
For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings, a king of kings, not the king of kings, a king of kings from the north with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. And he shall slay with the sword thy daughters in the field, and he shall make a fort against thee and cast a mount against thee and build up the buckler against thee. What does you know? What does it mean uh, casting a mount? Well, if you're surrounded a city, you want to build a uh, like a fort against the wall. You know, it's like a mount. It's like a mountain. So you can shoot arrows down onto the wall. Verse nine, and he shall set engines of war against thy walls, and with his axes he shall break down thy towers by reason of the abundance of his horses shall dust their dust shall cover thee thy walls shall shake at the noise of the horsemen and of the wheels and of the chariots when he shall enter into thy gates as men enter into a city wherein is made a breach with the hooves of his horses shall he tread down all thy streets. He shall slay thy people by the sword, and thy strong garrisons shall go down to the ground. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches and make a prey of thy merchandise. And they shall break down thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses. And they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. Keep this in mind. 12, verse 12. We'll go back and read that again. Because this has reference, I think, to verse 3 also. See, Nebuchadnezzar came first and destroyed him, but then afterwards they rebuilt it. But then there was another guy that came and destroyed it. So. And they, verse 12, And they shall make a spoil of thy riches, and make a prey of thy merchandise. And they shall break down thy walls, and destroy thy pleasant houses. And they shall lay thy stones, and thy timber, and thy dust in the midst of the water. And I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease, and the sound of thy harps shall be heard no more. So what do people do when they're happy? They sing and they, you know, play music, right? Verse 14. And I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to Tyrus, Shall not the isles shake at the sound of thy fall? When the wounded cry, when the slaughter is made in the midst of thee, then all the princes of the sea shall come down from their thrones and lay away their robes and put off their broidered garments. They shall clothe themselves with trembling. They shall sit upon the ground and shall tremble at every moment and be astonished at thee. See, Tyrus was a great ocean-going country that did a lot of trading among all the nations on the Mediterranean. And they were very rich because of the trade routes. Verse 17. And they shall take up a lamentation for thee and say to thee, How art thou destroyed? That wast inhabited of seafaring men. Yeah, they were sailors. The renowned city, which was strong in the sea, she and her inhabitants 
which caused their terror to be on all that haunt it. Now shall the isles tremble in the day of thy fall, yea, the isles that are in the sea shall be troubled at thy departure. And why would that be? Well, you know, if merchants were trading you things, making you wealthy, you making them wealthy, and then all of a sudden the merchants don't come anymore, who are you going to sell your stuff to? Yea, the isles that are in the sea shall be troubled at thy departure. For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make thee a desolate city, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and great waters shall cover thee, uh, not necessarily H2O, sometimes waters refers to a flood of people, people that you don't want, sometimes. Verse 20. When I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit, we're talking about hell there, with the people of old time, and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth. What's the low parts of the earth? Hell beneath, right? In places desolate of old, with them that go down to the pit, that thou be not inhabited, and I will and I shall set glory in the land of the living. I will make thee a terror, and thou shalt be no more, though thou be sought for, yet shalt thou never be found again, saith the Lord God. Now let's read up a little bit here. Uh, now, after Nebuchadnezzar left, they had a they rebuilt Tyre, and there was a guy named ne uh, Alexander, who history calls the Great, because he was a great conqueror. He conquered the Middle East, all the way to India, and he conquered Greece, and he conquered the land of Israel. He conquered Egypt. And the guy was like, oh, I don't know, 30, 33 years old, somewhere around that when he died. I guess he got too big for his britches and the Lord said, up, oh, you think you're God? Let me show you who God is. So he died. Well, guess what? His four top generals decided to split the territories between them. And of course, they had wars against each other. Um, I believe, now, Alexander was from Macedonia. As far as I'm concerned, Macedonia was basically a province or an area next to Greece, but I think he, they were Greeks. You know, sort of like Americans and Canadians. You know, we're, well, maybe in the 40s and the 50s we were the same people. We're not anymore. Now we're a bunch of heathens from every country in the world. But uh, there was a time when the Americans and Canadians were, we were the like kindred people, people from England, people from Germany, France, uh, what have you. You know? So Macedonia was basically, they were Greeks. They looked like Greeks. They spoke Greek. And Alexander went down to Greece and basically conquered all the separate city-states. You know, you had Athens, Sparta, you've heard of the Spartans, the Athenians, um, and, uh, you know, Corinth, Thessalonica. You know, these were all the places where Paul went in his journey. Well, maybe not Sparta. Uh, I think he went to Athens. 
But he conquered all those city-states. And then he conquered his, the land of Israel. He conquered Egypt. He conquered all the way to India. Uh, from what I understand, part of like Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, parts of that. I mean, the guy conquered basically the, all the known world at that time. Well, guess what? They had conquered it for, I think, a few hundred years. I'm not sure how long. But the land of Israel was conquered by the Greeks. Well, guess what language you speak when you're conquered? You learn the language of the conqueror, which is probably why the New Testament was written in Greek. It was the common language at the time. Now, people will try to tell you, oh, no, no, it was written in Hebrew, and then they mistranslated it into Greek. Don't fall for that. Matter of fact, uh, it was only recently that the Romans had conquered uh, the land. Matter of fact, uh, the uh, Parthian Empire, which was over in the area of Iran, had given the Romans a run for the money. They had switched hands a few times, uh, Jerusalem and what have you. But the thing is, like when Alexander had conquered Egypt, and one of his generals took it over. You've heard of Cleopatra? Everybody said, oh, yeah, she was an Egyptian woman. I don't think so. I think she was Greek. I really do. She was of that time period. You know? Isn't that funny? Greek. And, every, you know, she's supposed to be one of the most beautiful women of all time. I don't know. I didn't see her, but... You know, probably was. And you've heard of Anthony and Cleopatra. Well, and then the Romans came and then they conquered uh, the land of Israel and Jerusalem and that whole area. You know, uh, the, the Greeks and the Romans had fought each other. The problem was the Greeks, after Alexander died, they had four generals. Well, they started fighting amongst themselves. And once you start fighting amongst yourselves, it was an easy thing for the Romans to come in and take over. Because, you know, you can't fight amongst yourselves. It just doesn't work. So Rome took over. However, Alexander went to Tyre. Tyrus. And there was a city on the mainland. And he destroyed it. Now this was after, after Nebuchadnezzar had come and done this. When after they'd rebuilt it. And then, so Alexander came and destroyed Tyre, Tyrus. There was a city near the coast or on the coast. Destroy the city. Well, the uh, people that could, there was a little island not far off the coast. Matter of fact, you could see it. You could see the island from the the, uh, the coastline. They built a, you know, had a fort there and everything. That's where their ships were. So after he destroyed the city of Tyre, everybody that could fled to this island. And then Alexander said, well, surrender or die. And they basically said, uh, I don't think so. You know what Alexander did? He tried to take it. He tried to take it. He tried to take it. He couldn't do it. So he thought about it. And he says, you know what? What am, what am I doing? So he took all the ruins of the city, the walls, all the stones for the walls, and he carted them to the coast and threw them in the ocean. And he built a bridge. He took all, he scraped the dust, the dirt, the rocks of the city 
threw it in the ocean, and slowly built a bridge to the island. And guess what? It exists to this day. That island is now part of the coast. And do you know what they call the ruins of Tyre? The mainland? They call it the ruins of Tyre necropolis. Necro, N-E-C-R-O, means dead or death. I don't remember if it's uh, Latin or Greek, but necro means dead. And an opolis, you know, you've heard of metropolis. Uh, it's basically, basically it means dead city. But now Tyre, well, let's take a look back again at what the Bible says about it. Let's see. Ezekiel 26, verse 3. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and I will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up. Verse 4. Here, here's the punchline. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers and I will also scrape her dust from thee and make her like the top of a rock. So guess what? They took the island and turned it into like a top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil to the nations. See, Alexander destroyed the walls of Tyrus, broke down the towers, scraped the dust from her, threw it into the ocean, and built a bridge. Just like the Bible said here. Let's go to verse 12. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches and make a prey of thy merchandise. And they shall break down thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses, and they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. Exactly what Alexander did. But this was long before, well, I don't know how long, but uh, from Ezekiel to the time of uh, Alexander the Great. Let me look those dates up real quick. All right, according to Britannica, the um, Ezekiel was around from 592 to 570 BC, and then Alexander from 336 to 323, so about a, roughly about 150 years. So there was 150 years approximately between the time of Ezekiel to Alexander who is called the Great. Wow. And just like the Lord said, it wouldn't be inhabited anymore, and it was just a place to spread nets upon. Well, that's what the fishermen use that island for. Well, it's not an island anymore. They just spread their nets upon it to let them dry out in the sun so they don't rot. It's not inhabited anymore. And Tyrus is now called Necropolis. Oh, Necro, it means, it's Greek. I, I had to look that up. It's Greek and it means death. And Opolis, uh, like Metropolis, a word means city. Yeah, so dead city, city of death. You know, I don't know, but I understand that, um, let me look something up. There is a uh, Greek uh, Old Testament, and according to Wikipedia, and this seems to match what I understand too, it was uh, 
the uh, Septuagint, the old, the Greek Old Testament, was authorized by Ptolemy II Philadelphus. Uh, he was the son of Ptolemy, the Macedonian Greek general of Alexander the Great, who founded the uh, that uh, let's see where was his area? I think. Yeah, Alexandria, Egypt. So, he's the one that promoted the Library of Alexandria, which was supposed to be the greatest library in the history of the world, but the Romans destroyed it. Yeah, everybody says, oh, the Romans were great uh, builders. I wonder. But uh, he lived, he was Pharaoh from about 283 to 246 BC. So he was one of uh, Alexander's generals that took over Egypt. And, uh, but yeah, he, uh, he definitely helped put together the Greek Septuagint of the Old Testament. Now, when I went to Bible Cemetery, and studying under people I thought were, well, not, not the Bible college I went to, but listening to people that were staunch King James people. They always put down the Septuagint. They always put it down, put it down, put it down. And they always exalted the you-know-whos. I'm beginning to think, well, that uh, I would probably trust the Septuagint over a lot of what the uh, Masoretic text is, I don't know. I haven't studied it out. Don't take my word for it. But uh, that is why Greek was the common language of commerce in the days that Jesus was walking this earth in human form. Greek was the common language language. Now, if you had to deal with the government, you, chances are you might have to carry on in Latin. But the thing is, the um, Rome, uh, it was, you know, they knew, the educated people of Rome knew Greek. They knew both Greek and Latin. My opinion is, I bet you Jesus and Pilate probably conversed in Greek. Did Jesus know Latin? Possibly. Could if he wanted to. But everybody's like, oh, well, Jesus spoke uh, Hebrew. You, think, you honestly think Pilate was speaking to Jesus in Hebrew? I don't think so. But that's just my opinion. I think they spoke to each other in Greek. It was the common language of commerce and business. Everybody spoke Greek because Alexander had conquered that whole entire area. Matter of fact, Rome was a relative newcomer. So, and th let's face it, after Rome had conquered basically most of Europe, what do they call all the languages of Europe? They're all Latin-based. Even English has got a lot of Latin words in it. I've heard at least 20% of the English language is Latin-based. A lot of words. Matter of fact, if you uh, study law, you're going to learn a lot of Latin words. A lot of them. If you study medicine, you're going to learn a lot of Greek words. That's just the way it is. Metropolis. Greek word. You know. Ultra. Latin word. Corpse. Latin. So, the Septuagint. I'm beginning to have a lot more respect for the Septuagint. I only recently discovered... Uh, discovered it 
But the problem is you when people translate from the Greek to the English, you don't know uh, if the guy is actually a believer or a deceiver. That's the problem. See, the King James Bible translators, they were believers, as was King James. And he divided them up into three groups. And what they would do is they would have one group do, I don't know, maybe 20 books or 22 books or whatever. And then they would take their what they translated, give it to the other group who would look it over. And then they would give it to the other group. And they were all separated. And they all three worked on, uh, all three groups worked on different things. But then you couldn't get the groups to, you know, push their little side doctrines without the other groups complaining. So there was a consensus and they weren't all in the same place. So that's why I absolutely believe the King James. That's why I, I absolutely believe it. I mean, if they were all in the same place, they could probably corroborate with each other. But, you know, they were separated. And they couldn't talk to each other. And they said, well, what's a proper way to translate this, you know, sentence and paragraph and book? And they all had to agree on it. And King James was not a dummy either. That guy was a scholar. You should... You know, today you could read some of his writings on the Bible uh, issues, Bible topics. I mean, seriously. But his son was probably not very good because God allowed uh, somebody to come in and uh, depose him as king. I think his name was Charles, if I remember correctly. I know a little bit about English history, but not as much as I probably should, but uh, I think it was William of Orange that deposed him. I don't remember. All I know is the King James Bible, he went to a lot of trouble to assemble the greatest scholars of his day. There was one guy, I forget his name. He was 12 years old. And his father had given him such an education, I think in Greek, from a very, very young age, that he was tutoring college students, I forget it, Oxford, I mean, yeah, Oxford or uh, Cambridge, I forget which co college. He was tutoring college students. The guy's 12 years old. By the time he was in his 20s and 30s, he was even more of a scholar. Might have been Lancelot. And no, not the Lancelot of King Arthur's round table thing. No. I forget. You could read about the King James translators. They were they were absolutely scholars. I, I wish I knew some of the stuff they knew. But I don't. I don't read Greek and I don't know Hebrew. But don't kid yourself. The you-know-whos don't know it either. They know They know uh, that, that language that starts with a Y and ends with an ish. Yeah. And that's not Hebrew. It only looks like Hebrew. I mean, that's like, you know, writing, writing in German... The letters might be, most of the letters would be the same and then saying, oh, well, this is English. No. You know, those people over in the Middle East, they don't know Hebrew. They made up, they made up their own little language. You can hand them a copy of the Hebrew scriptures. They can't read it. They can't do it. It's all a farce. But, uh, Try telling that to the so-called evangelicals, you know. People like John Hagee hide that information. So, all right, well, I hope you learned 
a little something. I only recently found out about uh, Alexander and what he did with Tyre not that long ago, maybe maybe a year. I thought that was really interesting. I, I read up on uh, Alexander in my studies on why the New Testament was written in Greek. Well, they conquered the area. You know, so, yeah, everybody spoke Greek. Now, I do believe Jesus knew Hebrew. Absolutely. He, he could read the scrolls in the temple. But the average person walking around, don't kid yourself. You think they knew Hebrew? I doubt it. I doubt it. I mean, the Levites did. The priests did. I'm sure the Pharisees knew. Some of them. And the Sadducees knew. But the common people? No. And then they want to, you know, these Torah keepers want to convince you that, uh, oh, they all spoke Hebrew. You think they were speaking Hebrew in Babylon when they were in captivity for 70 years? Don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. They learned they learned a language of Babylon. That's what they learned. And then when Alexander came around and conquered everything, he's probably like, don't you talk to me in Babylonian. I want you to speak to me in Greek. And your children are going to learn Greek. And you're going to speak to me in my language. I conquered your area. And if you go to Miami, Florida, guess what? It doesn't speak English anymore. So, uh, yeah. But I got to admit, I, I have respect for the Cubans. I really do. Um, I used to work for them down in uh, Hialeah, which is their area. And uh, husband would work one or two jobs a lot of times they'd work two jobs they husband would almost never be home wife would stay home she'd cook house was clean immaculate very family oriented and uh you'd do work for them and do a good job and leave the place nice and clean when you're done they'd give you a nice tip you know uh, and they'd they'd give you ten dollars and apologize that that was all they had i you know they're hard working. So they can't drive worth a crap, but uh well, I, it's been a long time since I've lived down there, worked down there, but uh I got a lot of respect for the Cubans. I really do. So but sadly after the uh Castro sent the Mariels, uh they were the his prisoners, criminals, his uh insane asylum people after he sent those people up crime went through the roof miami um became a murder capital at least one year maybe two i forget so it's all drugs all right well i've been yapping long enough all blessings praise glory and honor yeah anybody's got questions you know i'll try to do my best to answer but uh all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.